if there is a certain gratification in presenting to the English public the first specimen of the literature of a new people, that gratification is lifted above triviality and grounded upon a serious critical basis when the book so presented is in itself a masterpiece. I do not think it will be questioned that Under the Yoke is a romance of modern history of a very high class indeed. These were the opening words of literary critic Edmund Gross, who wrote the preface to the English translation of the novel Under the Yoke by Bulgarian poet, novelist and playwright Ivan Vazov, often referred to as the patriarch of Bulgarian literature. Under the Yoke was the first Bulgarian novel to be translated into English and later into another 30 languages. The English version even predated the book's publication into Bulgarian. It was translated by William Morfield and published in 1894 by Heinemann's International Library London at times when the political events in Bulgaria were reported by the British media. To commemorate the 170th anniversary of Ivan Vazov on 9th of July, British Council staff from Sofia and London, as well as our partners, will read passages of the English translation. Ако има полза в представенето пред английската общественост за първи път пример от литературата на един нов народ, то тази полза далеч надхвърля тревилността, а почива върху безпристастнето на критичното мислене, когато така представената книга сама по себе си е шедьовър. Не мисля, че изобщо ще бъде поставено под въпрос, че подигото е модерен роман от много висока класа. Това са встъпителните думи на литературния критик Едман Грос, автор на предговора към английския превод на романа Подигото, на българския поет, писател и драматург Иван Вазов, често наричан патриарх на българската литература. Подигото е първият български роман, преведен на английския по-късно и на още 30 езика. Английската версия дори пресчества изданието на книгата на български язик. През 1894 г. книгата е публикувана от лондонското издателство Хайнеман в превод на Уилям Морфил във времена, когато политическите събития в България се отразяват широко в британските медии. На 9 юли 2020 г. по повод 170 годишната на Иван Вазов, екипът на Британски съвет в София и Лондон, заедно с партньори, четем пасажи от английския превод на подигото. Chapter 1. A Visitor On a delightful evening in May, Chorvaji Marco, bareheaded and in dressing gown and slippers, was sitting at supper with his family in the courtyard. As usual, the table was laid at the foot of the vines. On one side flowed the clear, cold brooklet, which sang night and day like a swallow as it rippled past. On the other, a high hedge of clustering ivy made an evergreen cover for the wall all year round. A lantern shone down from an overhanging branch of lilac, which spread its odorous blossoms over the heads of the assembled family. The family was a large one. Round Marco, his old mother and his buxom wife were crowded a complete circle of children, great and small, all armed with knives and forks, and ready for a terrible onslaught on their victuals. They fully personified the Turkish saying, Saman Dushmanlari, foes to their fodder. From time to time their father cast an approving glance at the execution done by the teeth of these indefatigable workers, and encouraged them with a smile and a merry, Set to, young'uns! Fill up the jug again, Penna! And the maid would go to the well, where the great wine jar was cooling and fill the earthenware jug, while Marco, handing it to the children, would say, Drink, you young rascals! And so the jar would go round the table. Eyes brightened, cheeks sparkled, and lips parted in a smile of satisfaction, and Marco would turn to his wife and, seeing a look of disapproval on her face, would say, Let them drink in my presence. I won't stint them of wine for I don't want them to become drunkards when they grow up. Marco was a thoroughly practical man. His education had been but slight. He was of the old regime. But thanks to his natural common sense, he understood human nature well 
and knew that people always hanker most after what is forbidden. For the same reason, he always entrusted his children with the key of his money chest so as to prevent any inclination to theft. Gocho, he would say, go and open the cypress wood chest and bring me the money bag. Or else, as he went out, my boy, just count out 20 liras in gold and give them to me when I come in. In spite of the then prevailing custom, which required that during meals, children should remain standing till their elders had finished as a mark of respect, Marco's children were always allowed to be seated, nor was this rule changed when there were guests present. I want them to get used to company, he would say, not to run wild and sink into their shoes when they see a stranger like Anka Raspopche, who had become proverbial for bashfulness of the most abject description whenever she met a man with cloth trousers on. As he was engaged with his business all day, Marco only saw his whole family once a day at supper, and it was then that he carried out his system of education in his own peculiar manner. For though he had but little education himself, he loved learning and the learned. He was one of those numerous patriots whose eager zeal for the new educational movement has, in so short a time, filled Bulgaria with schools. He had but a dim notion of the practical benefits likely to accrue to a nation, then consisting almost exclusively of farm labourers, artisans and merchants. Marco saw with regret that there was neither work nor bread for the learned when they left school. But he felt he understood in his heart that some secret force lay hidden in learning which would change the world. He believed in learning as he did in God, without question. Hence, he sought to advance it as far as lay in his power. His only ambition was to be elected a member of the school committee, as indeed he invariably was, being universally respected and esteemed. For this modest social duty, Marco spared neither time nor trouble but he sedulously avoided all other dealings with the authorities and especially with the Konak. Chapter 10. The Nunnery. The convent had the reputation of being the most fertile hotbed of scandal in the whole city. It was the cradle of every bit of tittle-tattle which made the round of and scandalised the hearths of the erring laity of the town. It was there that Betrothals were whispered of and prepared, and sometimes impending marriages broken off too. From thence innocent little tales would set out on their way round the town, and return well and hearty, but magnified a hundredfold, or else completely metamorphosed. Naturally such a centre of gossip attracted troops of lay friends, especially on feast days, when these were regaled by the Holy Sisters with stories of the town and Morella Cherry Preserves. Sister Haji Roboyama, whose acquaintance we have already made with her brother Jordan's, was renowned as the most skilful prayer into all the secrets of the town and the most inveterate scandalmonger in it. She had at one time been the abbess, but a revolution in the little state had deposed her. Nonetheless, she was still morally the moving spirit of the community her advice was appealed to in every matter. She vouched for the accuracy of truthful rumours and exposed the incorrect. She had the prerogative of starting fresh tales which afforded mental pabulum for the little republic for some days, after which they spread beyond the confines of the cluster, of the cloister. Chapter 11. Radha's Trials for some days, Radha had been very busy because the annual examination day was approaching. The eventful morning arrived. The girls began to flock into school quite early, all decked out and arrayed in their best by their mothers. They flitted about like a swarm of bees, conning their lessons over yet once more 
before the examination. Church was over and people began to crowd into the schoolhouse according to the custom to be present at the examination. The doors, windows and platform were tastefully decorated with flowers and the picture of Saints Cyril and Methodius was half hidden by a gorgeous frame of roses festooned with garlands of ivy. The front benches were soon filled up by the pupils and the rest of the floor was occupied by the spectators, the most important being in front, and some of these were even provided with chairs, amongst the latter being several of our acquaintances. But a few empty seats still remained for such distinguished visitors as might yet come. Meanwhile, Radha was busily marshalling her pupils along the benches and whispering to them a few last instructions. Her sweet face was flushed with excitement on this momentous day, and her great moist eyes made her look prettier than ever. Transparent rosy clouds flitted across her cheeks and showed the agitation of her simple soul. Radha felt that a hundred curious looks were directed towards her and the thought made her shy and uncomfortable. But when the head school mistress began her speech and everybody's attention was fixed on her, Radha felt a great relief and began to pluck up her courage. Radha followed the children's replies with the closest attention and every little blunder they made was reflected by a painful contraction of her features. But their clear, ringing little voices, their tiny red lips which seemed to attract kisses, decided their fate. She caressed them with her glance, encouraged them with a heavenly smile, and tried to instill her whole soul into their faltering little lips. Chapter 16, The Theatricals. This is why the forthcoming representation had caused such excitement among the townspeople. It was impatiently awaited as a great event which would be a pleasant change in the monotonous life of Bela Cerkva. Everybody was looking forward to it. The richer housewives had got out their best finery, the poorer had sold their yarn in the market and at once invested the proceeds in tickets instead of making their usual purchases of salt or soap. Nothing but the theatricals was talked of at family and social gatherings. Old women asked each other at church, Gena, are you going to Genevieve tonight? And prepared to weep over the long-suffering countess. At home, the conversation ran on the names of the actors who had taken the various parts. Universal satisfaction was expressed when Ognyanov was cast for the Count. The wily Golos, who eventually goes mad, was to be played by Fratiu, who was fond of emotional parts. In order to increase the effect, Fratiu had let his hair grow for a month. Ilya the Inquisitive was the servant Draco and rehearsed 20 times a day how he should fall when Golos pierces him with the sword. He was also to bark later on in the piece as the Count's dog and practiced this part with equal assiduity. For Genevieve, Deacon Vicenti had at first been suggested on account of his good looks and long hair, but it was thought unsuitable for a person in holy orders to take part in the piece and the role was given to another, together with a pot of white pomatum to cover his moustache. The secondary parts were also distributed. The theatre began to fill at sunset. The front rows were reserved for the notabilities, including the Bey, who had been specially invited. At his side sat Damian Grigorov, who had been put there to amuse him. The general public filled the rest of the room and soon began to clamour eagerly for the curtain to rise. The noisiest of all was Mother Ginka. She knew the play by heart and was telling her neighbours right and left all about it. What were the first words the Count had to say? Her Gisimel in the next row 
was explaining how much larger the Bucharest Theatre was and what was the meaning of the pitchfork on the curtain. The orchestra consisted of the local gypsy musicians who played chiefly the, the Austrian national anthem, doubtless in honour of the German countess. At last the solemn moment arrived. The Austrian hymn ceased and the curtain rose amid murmurs of admiration. The first to appear was the Count. Perfect silence ensued. One would have thought the theatre was empty. The Count began to speak and Mother Ginka prompted him in front. Whenever the Count left out or altered a word, she cried, that's wrong!